Our keynote to kickstart our event is entitled Our Eight Predictions for the Southeast Asia Tech Scene. Ladies and gentlemen, here to kick off Wild Digital Southeast Asia 2018 with that keynote, please welcome the co founder and group CEO, Catcher Group, Patrick Grove. Okay, <clears throat> um, show of hands, who are the 13% that said they want to go to the Wild Digital after party tomorrow night? Yeah, yeah, the DJ and I salute you. <clears throat> um, so four things, I want to say four things very quickly. Number one, I want to thank everyone in this room from the bottom of my heart because we started this event four years ago. And for the first event, we only had 200 people. And this year, we've got 1,000 people who've signed up to attend this event. So thank you so much. <clears throat> we've also got 100 speakers confirmed, and the speakers are absolutely amazing. One of the things that the team do an amazing job is that if you're going to speak on stage, you either have to have something amazing to say, or and or you must have raised at least 10 million US dollars. So a big round of applause for all the awesome speakers that we have sharing and learning. <clears throat> now, number two, um, I, want to do, I want everyone to join me in giving a big round of applause to the Wild Digital team. I'm going to name them. They work tirelessly in putting this together. It's five girls and one guy, he's probably the luckiest guy in the workplace. Um, and my mother always told me that if you want a good job done, give it to a man. If you want an amazing job done, give it to a woman. So that's right. <clears throat> so a big round of applause for Stephanie, Melody, Lenny, <clears throat> Christina and Angela, and Surin. Big round of applause. Thank you. We actually broke two records globally at this event today. Number one, I think we're the only tech event in the world to ever have a DJ as the opening. So a big round of applause to the DJ. <clears throat> um, and secondly, <clears throat> there's always been a lot of uh, complaints that the tech scene is very male dominated. And when you go to tech events, the typical male to female ratio is usually 99 to one at tech events. So if you're a single girl, it's generally a great place to meet guys. Um, <clears throat> so we've done a really, really great job in trying to identify a lot of great females in the tech scene to really support them and encourage them to do more. And if you look at the speakers, there's a lot of great female speakers. Anyway, I want to say that we have, we probably hit the world record and that the male to female ratio at this event is probably five to one, which is the greatest we've ever seen in a tech event. So a big round of applause for all of the women who are here tonight. <clears throat> so, Thirdly, and this is a little bit personal, um, <clears throat> we're going to do a big round of applause to Dinesh, my chief of staff. <clears throat> mm. And the reason being is not because he's handsome, good looking, smart, and all of that, um, is that two weeks ago I actually went for vocal cord surgery. And <clears throat> the doctor said, Patrick, in two weeks' time, you're either going to have an amazing voice or you're gonna sound like someone who's in the middle of a sex change. And unfortunately, I think I probably am skewing the latter. So literally about five minutes ago, I said, Dinesh, could you do me a really big favor? And could you give the keynote presentation for me? So when I call him on stage, I want you guys to give him a really, really big round of applause because I think this is the first time that Dinesh has ever presented to more than three people. <clears throat> um, so I will be around, I will be fully involved under doctor's orders. I just can't be speaking for more than 20 minutes uninterrupted, which obviously is a thing that I like to do. Um, <clears throat> fourthly, my last thanks, and this applies to everyone in the room, 
if you're looking to be part of the tech scene or you are part of the tech scene, last week, Southeast Asia crossed 400 million internet users. 400 million, think about that number for a second. The number is absolutely massive. Okay, what that means is that any tech business that we're involved in now targets an audience 50% bigger than America, 50% bigger than Europe, double the size of Japan, only half the size of China. So when you think about 400 million users, it absolutely means that this part of the world can build big, 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 massive internet companies. <clears throat> I remember three years ago, Anthony um, Tan from Grab, he was a good friend of Walt Disney, a good friend of mine, and we would always complain and say, you know, why is it so hard to convince people to invest in Southeast Asian internet companies? And that was three years ago. And what we've seen in the last three years has been absolutely amazing. I mean, Grab alone has convinced people outside of Southeast Asia to invest about three to four billion US in Southeast Asia. Some of the companies that we've involved in have convinced people outside of Southeast Asia to bring about half a billion US into Southeast Asia. What that also means is that now be that we have 400 million internet users who are just seconds away. That means anyone in this room can come up with an idea for an app on Monday, find someone on the web to build it for you on a Tuesday, on Wednesday, test it, Thursday, launch it in the app store, Friday, have it go absolutely viral and explosive. And on Monday, you can have Apple send you an email saying, hey, guess what? <clears throat> 400 million people downloaded your app and 100 million of them paid a dollar to use it. So we're sending you a check for $100 million. This is now absolutely possible in Southeast Asia. And it wasn't possible two, three years ago. So I just wanna say that all of us, we are participating in probably one of the greatest opportunities ever in economic history and that's to be in the digital sector in Southeast Asia. So I'm, I'm deeply honored and proud to be part of that, and I hope you are too. So thank you so much. <clears throat> so could you guys give a big, 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 big round of applause for Dinesh? Thank you so much. <clears throat> hey, thanks, dude. So um, I've, I've been working with Patrick for under two years now, and he, he never keeps to, he never fails to keep me on my toes. I remember last year's Wild Digital, 12 hours before the event, he says, hey, I've got this keynote thing tomorrow at 9 a.m., I need you to create a whole presentation for me. Okay. Yes, yesterday, 12 hours before the event today, he's like, hey, I'm gonna need your help, Wild Digital, I have a keynote tomorrow. Uh, you need a presentation, right? Nope, I have a presentation, I just need you to do the keynote. I don't even know what's going to happen next year, so <laughs> I guess you'll wait to find out. Um, cool. This clicker thing. I think we'll skip this. So th this year, as Patrick mentioned, this is the biggest ever Wild Digital event we've had in the last four years. More than 1,000 people, more than... I think 100 speakers confirmed 33 sessions, so I think it's gonna be great. Uh, there are a couple of new things we've introduced this year, so before I go into the predictions bit, uh, I just wanna touch on that really quickly. Um, historically, we've always had moderators and panels ask questions, but I think there, was co there were complaints that the questions weren't controversial enough. So this year, we've introduced a new session with Joel, uh, where all the questions are gonna come from the audience, um, so you guys have the opportunity to ask the tough questions never been asked before. <laughs> Sorry, Joel. Um, startup Battlefield, uh, this is another interesting one. So we've got three of the most exciting co-working spaces in Southeast Asia on one stage where they're going to pitch their business and talk a little bit about the future of co-working. Uh, but the format's a little bit different and a little bit more fun and exciting, so you definitely want to want to catch that one. Women in tech, so, so Patrick made a really good good point. You know, the last, the last few Wild Digital events, you know, we've noticed that 99% of all the attendees were male, which we found kind of weird as we were thinking about the event this year where we know there are a lot of great women out there in tech doing great things with great vision, great, great ideas, and really great disruptive mindsets. And we thought, you know, why, why are they coming to World Digital? So, so what we did this year was we actually sponsored, we initially didn't sponsor 50 tickets, free tickets for women who wanted to attend the event, but the demand was so insane that we had to upsize that to 150.
S SDA mentors. So we have, so we introduced the Startup Disruptor Arena, I think, two years ago. And, and this was, as you know, Wild Digital has a really high requirement for speakers where, you know, if you're a founder, you have, you have got to have raised more than 10 million US dollars to earn a, a spot on stage. But there are a lot of great companies that we think will be able to raise more than 10 million over the next 12 months for, in time for Nexus Wild Digital. And we said, why don't we give them a chance to present the idea on stage uh, at Wild Digital and, and we'll pick the winner. And there's obviously a special prize for the winner, but this year we thought what would make it even more exciting is we, if we give the winner an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with two of the greatest tech, tech leaders in the space, so Kylie and Patrick himself, unless he tells me 12 hours before that I need to do it instead. <laughs> Uh, and while venture tech, so, so I'm not sure if most of you are aware, but the Malaysian government's been, I mean, the Malaysian government's been doing a lot for the tech scene, but they introduced a bunch of rules at the end of last year for, to attract more VC investment into the country and to attract more, um, to get, get non-traditional corporates to start investing into tech. So there's a bunch of really interesting rules and a lot of incentives, and, and we partnered with MDEC this year to, to create a sub-segment of Wild Digital called Wild Venture Tech, and this is happening tomorrow. So if you want to find out more about those rules, um, then you, should de you definitely don't want to give that a miss. Uh, why Southeast Asia? Um, go back a second. So I don't know if you realize, but this next year is actually Catch-Us 20th anniversary in creating an internet business in Southeast Asia. So I think Patrick and the founders recognized early on that there's a massive opportunity in Southeast Asia, huge market that's increasingly coming online. And you know, they, they, were, they had vision back in 1999 to see that there's huge opportunity here to create an internet business. And, you know, and, when, and we realized that in the run-up to that 20th anniversary, we thought, why don't, why don't we make us a bunch of predictions on what we think will happen over the next two years based on all the experience that Catch has had over the last 18 years uh, running internet businesses. So, so I'm not sure if, if hopefully most of you have read the, the predictions report. We released that earlier this year. And if you haven't, you should check it out. It's on, the web, it's on our website. Uh, but I'm just going to run through each of those eight predictions really quickly here. As you can see, I've never done one that's this before. I'm messing up the, the clicker thing. So by the end of 2019, Southeast Asia will have 460 million users. We're already at 400, as Patrick said just now. And we will have raised collectively as a region more than 10 billion in private tech funding. So, so we took a step back. We realized that you know, private tech funding has really exploded in 2017. So, so as we, as we kind of look and analyze that, we took a step back and said, what, what are the, how do we distill that into two key drivers that's fueling that funding? And what we realized was that there's a, there's a huge correlation between internet speed and the number of internet users, so, which, which kind of makes sense. As internet speeds become faster, the user experience that someone would have using a, an internet application becomes more enhanced and is more likely to continue to use that application. So that obviously leads to more users coming online and more users doing more things online, which would, which would then lead to a bigger addressable market for any company that's trying to venture in the tech space, which means that as the market grows, and if you want to meet the needs of those users, you need to raise more capital. And if founders need to raise more capital and, and investors see the opportunity as well, that will lead to a massive boom in funding. So it really boils down to, fixed internet infrastructure speeds, leading to growth in users, leading to an increasing need for capital, leading to, the to investors actually funding those companies. And you kind of see that a little bit in this chart. So the gray, lines, the gray lines internet speed, I think it's fixed broadband speed here just as a proxy, but it's really gone up over the last 10 years, between 2007 and 2017, it's gone up 10 times, more than 10x, in terms of how fast the internet is. And, and you see that correlation with user growth as well. But I really want to point, point to you two, two, key, two key years which I've highlighted in a, the red box over there. Between 2009 and 2010, you had a growth, uh, the number of internet users in Southeast Asia exceeded 100 million. That meant we had more internet users in Southeast Asia collectively than Japan. 
and you saw this massive uptick in funding. The chart doesn't do it justice, but it was actually, I think, five million in 2009 of private tech funding, going up to just under 100 million in 2010. So that's a massive increase. And you can really draw the correlation to the growth in users crossing 100 million. And then that obviously led, that, that trend continued to, to follow. And then you see this massive uptick in between 16 and 17, where funding went up by almost 4 billion. And coincidentally, that's also when the number of internet users in Southeast Asia exceeded 300 million, which meant that we were a bigger market than the US. And I think investors recognized that and, started, and recognized the potential of the region and started putting money in. So if we, if we then extrapolate that forward and we assume that the growth in users continues to fall at the same rate and internet speeds continue to improve as well, then it's not far-fetched if you could say by 2019, there could be as much as 10 billion in private tech funding in the region. Which leads me to the next point, is that the first Decacorn will emerge from Southeast Asia. So, so when we wrote the, this report early in the year, uh, this, is, this was kind of the thesis. We said, if you believe the first, the first prediction that the number of users represents the opportunity in the space. So we said, okay, what market globally can we sort of draw a comparison to? And we said, okay, we, we take China. 10 years ago, in 2008, they had 300 million internet users, which is, which is not too far off from where we were la at the end of last year as well, 330 million users. And the combined valuation of, of the three leaders in the Chinese internet space was 22 billion, which is similar to the combined valuation of the leaders in Southeast Asia today. So we were like, okay, that's interesting. There, there are definitely some similarities there. And as we look to 2019, which is two years from 2017, and you, add, and you look at 2010, two years from to 2008 in China, if, if you believe our prediction that we would have 460 million people in Southeast Asia, China actually had 459 million people in 2010, and the valuation uptick in getting that from that growth of users uh, resulted in the valuation being 94.5 billion for all those three companies. So if you s assume that the same companies on the previous slide in Southeast Asia in 2017 experienced the same uptick in valuation from that increase in users, and you extrapolate that, you could, you could say the combined market valuation of these companies would be 86 billion, which meant that you'd just divide by six. Every, each company could be, each one of these companies could have a valuation of up to 12 billion which is not inconceivable as you see Grab's already raised around at 10 billion. So I think we've already hit this prediction. The other interesting thing was that as we look back over time and, and we look at all the companies that have hit huge valuations in the region from 500 million to a billion and we look at how much time it took to hit that valuation, we notice an, in we notice an interesting trend where you look at the pioneers in the space, Job Street, iProperty, it took you know, 19 years for Job Street to hit a 500 million valuation. It took eight years for iProperty to hit a 500 million dollar valuation. But all, all of a sudden, and if you think back at the few points earlier, internet speeds getting faster, more users coming online, bigger market, bigger valuations, which meant that like, the, the amount of time taken for all of these companies to hit that billion dollar valuation decreased dramatically, right? Grab only took three years to become a unicorn. So if you, if you assume that the trend continues to follow, we, 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 we're actually making a bold prediction where the next unicorn in Southeast Asia will actually, will actually hit that valuation in under three years. This is another interesting point, uh, which, I, which I think it's, this is a little bit, this is more apparent to everyone where you can see over the last three years, as I think Chinese, Chinese companies uh, realize that, that there's a lot of growth opportunity in Southeast Asia and, and they're pouring a lot of money into the region and you definitely see that over the last three years where, you know, 2015 and 16, you only had, 
you know, one significant Chinese investment into the region per year. But in 2017, that totally exploded where you see massive amounts of capital being poured from Chinese companies in, in the biggest, some of the biggest unicorns in Southeast Asia, where I think you know, three of the biggest tech, be tech deals represent 72% of the value. And you know, we, we definitely see this as a trend that's going, going to continue to follow. This is, this is an interesting one. Uh, historically, if you, look, if you look back a few slides ago and you see those companies that hit $500 million valuations, if you look at Job Street, iProperty, historically, a lot of that came from M&A exits, right? Uh, whereas increasingly you're seeing that as the market, as in more internet users come online, the market gets bigger and, the, and companies realize that they can create a sustainable business uh, that's, that has a big enough addressable market to attract big valuations in public markets. So historically, it might be, it might, it, it might be a company seeing an opportunity to acquire a company in Southeast Asia to get a foothold in the market, but that company in Southeast Asia didn't have a big enough market to sustain public market valuation. But because the market's so big now, you're seeing that a lot of companies in South Asia realize that you know, if I can figure out how to address that market and create a business model that works, we don't need to sell to another company. We can, act, we can actually get really high valuations in public markets and continue to, to own and sustain that business. And you, and you saw that last year with two of, the, two of the biggest IPOs we've had to date in the region. And, the, and, and the, on the other end of the spectrum, as you, see, as you see more funding being poured into the region at higher valuation levels, investors are going to want to see a return. And, and to, to justify those valuation levels, a lot of the private companies who've raised a lot of money at high valuations are going to need to grow very fast to meet those valuation expectations. And a lot of times, a lot of these companies will find that Growing organically isn't enough. To meet that, to, to grow as fast to justify a ten billion dollar valuation, it's probably going to be a mix of organic and inorganic growth. Which means that a lot of these companies are going to start to do a lot more M and A to help them grow faster than before. And and we've definitely seen that. There's been a lot of deals done by Grab, Gojek, and, and obviously the biggest one we've seen so far is you know Grab actually acquiring Uber. This is, this is another interesting one that's also going to fuel growth in the ecosystem over, over the next few years. His, historically, you know, 10 years ago, I think there was very little government support. Uh, there were a few governments that actively made an effort to grow the tech scene. That's changed dramatically over the last couple of years. I think some, some governments are doing more than others, but I think it's clear to see that every government in Southeast Asia is doing their part in growing the digital economy. The other interesting thing is that there are a lot of co over the last few years we've seen an explosion in corporate venture capital. I think co corporates have realized that you know you know these are corporates that one realize the massive opportunity in digital and they and realize that they have to they have to find a way to get into the space and get themselves educated. And two, some of these corporates are the ones that uh, not referring to any particular one in slide, but in general, like some of them realize that you know they've had businesses that were disrupted by tech companies, and and they realize that they need to get themselves educated and become and participate in the digital ecosystem themselves. So you see a lot of activity in corporates, and a lot of them are creating VCs of their own, or investing in other VCs, or striking partnerships with startups. But there's definitely a lot of activity uh, and a lot of capital being poured by corporates in space. This is an interesting one. Uh, I'm sure everyone, everyone's uh, heard of Bitcoin. Is there anyone that hasn't? Um, so we thought we'll do an interesting poll. Uh, how many people in this room, and we had a little bet amongst ourselves as to how many people we think in the room will have actually invested in crypto. Um, so why don't, why don't you do, I don't know how the poll thing works, but we want to do a poll on how many of you have actually invested in crypto? Thinking about it, me, crypto what? No Bitcoin? Interesting. 
there's actually a lot more people than we thought who've invested in crypto. And a, a bunch of you are kind of on the fence, waiting to see if the market picks up again. And I, and I think this poll, you know, thinking about that's interesting because I think this is actually a good representation of how governments and regulators in Southeast Asia are viewing the space. Uh, you see some governments that are kind of on the fence, waiting to see what, what they're, what they're going to do, how the space plays out, how can you regulate the space. There's some gov governments that have gone all in and announced specific rules to encourage and promote crypto usage in their country. And there's some governments that have you know, taken a stance in saying they're going to ban everything and, and they're going to take a little bit longer to get educated in space. And I think this poll thing is still running, so I can't change the slide. So in the Philippines, is one of them. Obviously, you see for the first time ever, I think this is the first economic zone in the world that has decided to incorporate crypto rules and benefits and incentives uh, to promote and govern the usage of crypto in the country. So that, that's a big step forward. And, and Thailand's also announced similar rules. Singapore obviously has announced rules of their own. But I think what we'll see over the next 12 months is, is a lot of governments realizing that, that crypto, crypto is, 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 is a phenomenon that has to be addressed. And you know, there are going to be more, sp more rules in place to govern the use of crypto, which probably will lead us to crypto being a legal tender at some point. So we actually had one last prediction to make, which we missed out on the report. Uh, and we kind of need your help with it. Just <laughs> you can't, can't really ignore World Cup. <laughs> this will be interesting. Brazil. Malaysia, that's, that's disruptive thinking right there. <laughs> Looks like England's probably, probably like top seed. I'm an England fan, so. Well, I, I, I guess we'll wait a couple of weeks to find out. And, and may, maybe at some point we'll get Malaysia to win the World Cup, hopefully. <laughs> Or Federer. <laughs> so, so lastly, um, I think we at Catch Up, we would we would love nothing more than to have all our predictions come true. And I think you know, we we think you know, everyone, every, I think everyone in this room today has a part to play in making all those predictions come through. So we really want everyone to network, meet new people, collaborate, come up with new ideas, figure out what the next big disruptive idea is. We've got a whole bunch of really good quality people in this space right here in this room. So really make the most of the next two days and, and, and most of all have fun. We've got, we've got an awesome DJ and don't forget to be at an after party too if you want to catch more of that DJ's action. All right, thank you. <laughs>